of art. As well as roods and rude screens, medieval carvers became masters at enriching the performance of sacraments within a church. This 15th century baptismal font cover was designed to protect the holy water from contamination. Some said even from theft by witches. At the top is a pelican shedding its own blood, a symbol of Christ's sacrifice. On the count of three, from underneath, just slowly up. One, two, three. It's also a great feat of medieval technology. It retracts upwards, like a telescope. In medieval times, as that soared up, it must have been wonderful, just wonderful. But this font cover is not just an incredible work of art, it's also a miraculous survivor. During the English Civil War, it attracted the attention of the radical Puritan William Dowsing, who led a troop of image breakers through East Anglia. Well, in the 1640s, William Dowsing was appointed to destroy any religious symbols in Suffolk. His officers came to Ufford, where the church wardens and the other people of Ufford resisted their admission. He could not get into the church. So he came again later in that same year to inspect the church, inflicted a great deal of damage, but describing the font cover as glorious, he let it be. The font cover is just very special to everyone in Ufford and the children and grandchildren of people who have lived here come back to be christened here. It's difficult to describe the emotions which the font cover creates. It's just part and parcel of the heritage of the people of Ufford, and I think we all feel that. It gives us a sense of pride, which is probably a great sin. But carpenters didn't just create images of the divine for churches. They could also conjure up visions of damnation. bench ends show the seven deadly sins. The sinners being swallowed by a giant fish. Here you can see two lovers embracing, showing the sin of lust. Here a drunken lout pouring wine to show the sin of sloth. And here you can even see avarice with his little money bags. For a largely illiterate population, this was a visual reminder to obey God's law. In the Middle Ages, where there's a sense of order, there is also a corresponding sense of disorder. So the ordered universe, God's universe, has its exact mirror opposite, the disorganized, the chaotic, the evil. And it's in articulating that evil, or that opposite, that the good and the ordered is reinforced. The practice of carving bench ends almost came to an end with the Reformation. 
but it was revived in this church, St. John the Baptist, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Here you see the religious iconography you might expect in a church. But many designs are far more unexpected. They were paid for by village parishioners, commemorating lost loved ones. This bench end was for a stonemason, showing his mallet and chisel. The carver Lawrence Beckford created this boat on a rocky sea in memory of a local merchant seaman. And this intricate foliage scene for the rector's wife who died in the early 90s. Unlike the medieval bench ends, which are, are, tell biblical stories, this is very much a personal bench end, and it depicts the wildlife and nature, because she was a, a, a wonderful garden, a really loved gardening. The foliage is living. The timber's living, the foliage is living, the design's living, and you can carve um, um, twists and curls. Um, you've got, like for here, for example, you have a, a turnover, um, and you can get lovely undulations and a very lovely, lovely sort of suant line. Absolutely, carving foliage in, in oak, I think it's fantastic. It's not very often and common for a family member to commission a bench end as such as this and, and, and the merchant ship one. Um, but it, they obviously feel very deeply um, and, and their partner obviously was a huge part of their life and they believe it's worth commemorating. Um, and you know, they're, they're, they must have immense joy when, when it's completed and it's fitted. You know, that they must feel very proud of their, of their, of their lost one. Um, and I think it's, it's a fantastic recognition of that person's life. You know, it's, it's wonderful. As the church grew more powerful, so did the pride and ambition of some of its priests. A great cathedral was never just about the glory of God. It was also the seat of bishops, who were princely figures with great power and wealth at their disposal. Much of the splendor of Exeter Cathedral is because of the extravagant and rather proud Bishop Walter de Stapledon. In the early 14th century, he was given the Bishopric of Exeter. A year's revenue from the cathedral was spent on a great feast to celebrate his enthronement. De Stapledon created the greatest tribute of all the Middle Ages to the role of the bishop. A special place within the cathedral reserved just for him, where he would sit in splendor before his congregation. This is the bishop's throne a 60-foot wooden canopy, pointing like a giant finger towards God. It was made by local craftsmen over a period of six years. Almost hidden in this grand confection is the Apostle St. Peter, the first Bishop of Rome, showing the bishop's role had a direct link to Christ himself. The throne looks splendid now, because in early 2012, John Allen and Hugh Harrison led the restoration of this masterpiece. 
the throne was covered in scaffolding, which allowed them to explore areas even the bishop wouldn't have seen. Oh, there we go. We're standing under the vault of one of the most extraordinary pieces of medieval woodwork in Europe, and it is immensely richly carved. It's also extremely complex in its instruction, and it is really the first magnificent grand piece of medieval woodwork to survive in England. They carved it with such verve that you can still see the chisel marks. In fact, one of the carvers, he had a, uh, uh, he had a nick in his chisel, and you can actually see the little lines where the, the wood isn't cut because of the nick in the chisel. And you can think, you know, he must have been not very happy and had to send his chisel back to the uh, blacksmith probably the next day to get the, the nick taken out of it. Well, I think everyone knows this is a great masterpiece. It's one of the most famous objects in medieval art in England. But somehow, when you get up to it and you see the sheer amount of work in yeah. it and the sheer panache of it all yeah. and uh, the fantastic quality and the complexity of yeah. it, it just takes your breath away, doesn't it, that they achieved? Yes, such absolutely things. superb. Yeah. But Exeter also shows that while woodworkers could master the profound, they could also be ridiculous. Far away from the gaze of the congregation, hidden under the choir stalls, are some rather daring carvings. Monstrous mythological creatures. An alluring mermaid. A centaur firing an arrow. These remarkable objects are called misericords, places to rest during prayer. It comes from this idea of the seat of mercy, but because the seat was actually underneath the bottom of somebody, <laughs> you couldn't really have sacred depictions there. It's amazing some of the scenes that survive on these misericords. Wood, of course, is just a cheap material. And I think people were carving fabulous beasts and animals and dragons and wyverns and all the rest of it just because it's fun. And from down below to on high, carvers would create elaborate decoration, insisting on perfection, even though no human eye would really be able to see it. One way of beautifying your cathedral was to create a great boss to cover over the joins where the ribs in the ceiling meet. This amazing chunk of oak is one of the oldest objects in our collection, made at the very beginning of the 14th century. And it's a ceiling boss from St Albans Abbey in Hertfordshire. What we have in this swirling and complex design are leaves, curling around, and out of the leaves springs forward the head and claws of a lion uh, that is grasping a bone in its jaws. And having been removed from the vault, we can see it in a way that no one using the cathedral 700 years ago could have seen it because we can see the underside of the boss. So what we can see here is the sheer physical effort that carvers had to put in to create something like this. We're seeing vividly the marks left by the chisels. This would have been a, a huge amount of work, hollowing out heavy, hard work. So there was uh, a lot of chopping out needed to be done before the delicate work on the outside could be completed. Medieval wood carvers had spent centuries using their work to beautify churches and cathedrals. But there was increasingly a tension between the power of the priests and the power of the crown. And both claimed to derive their authority from God himself. And some of the finest woodwork was to be used as a political